class? It is actually for that. So there is, I think it's 322L that uses that for this. Okay. Um, but usually, uh, I mean, I mean, you'd have to ask the instructor, uh, but usually, at least for me, I, I don't mind if students are in the class. Usually you'll probably just sit in the back. And stop. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I was, I was watching the Laker game for it. or the Ducks game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I looked at it, it starts out. Oh, okay. I don't know. Oh, yeah, the ones that uh, went to the bar right now. They're still watching the game. <laughs> I don't know why I saw 3 30. Uh, baseball. Yeah, I, I'm a little baseball. Plays too slow. Daughter's stink. <laughs> why the daughter's always disappointing me? I'd like to see him just pick up their um, doctor's manager. So we'll just be happy. Angels, angels are even worse. Angels are so. Well, that's what I'm saying. It'd be nice for them to pick up doctor's manager and then they'll just make the playoffs and exit out first round and he'll be happy because he wouldn't be happy. Angel, angel fans would be happy. They play out for <laughs> once. We had Shohei and Mike Trout for a long time. Yeah, I know. So three times in VP and has the same amount of playoff games. <laughs> really sad. <laughs> it really <laughs> is. Probably good at what up or hockey games. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the means that the Yep. So, if you were to do the new method, yes. Yeah. So, if you're using like, classical means, okay. And the positive one, what we go, um, you can do it with the with the uh, X I see that okay. yeah and that is uh so it would be to the point so it would be so um, okay so our initial guess this would be our X I yes okay. this is our X I exactly and then we can basically exactly yeah. all right yeah and you can have one of these to be done on uh, the code. Do that one yeah. piece without? Okay. Yep. All right. I'll let you decide which one. Yeah. I'll be able to show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good one. Thanks. I got a few minutes to be sure for it. Nice. Good.
looks like that big about when they find it because there's a meeting and ran it and put all the witness in and yeah. That's good. So it's supposed to be easy for it to be fun the fun part. All right, it's uh, five thirty. Let's go and get started. All right, good. Uh, good evening, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Uh, you're good. Hanging in there. A week off would be very nice to go. Uh, well, we're going to strike next week. <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're they're voting on it. Uh, I'm not in the union, so you know, but uh, if the union hey. uh, if the union tells me to take a week off, you know, I, I don't we know what you know, to do. It. <laughs> well, we'll uh, no, well, we'll 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 decide when we get there. So hopefully, hopefully we don't have to. Okay. Um. So the plan for today is uh we are going to continue on with our lecture notes, and so I think we have just one more lecture on trusses. Uh, I think that's just about as much of trust as, as I can handle. So after today, we'll be done with that. Uh, and then on Thursday, we'll, we'll cover beams. Okay. okay, so we're getting uh, we're getting pretty close to crunch time for the midterm project. So the midterm project is due next Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. Um, and so I've, I've gotten a few questions. The questions have definitely ramped up about the midterm project the last a week or so. So it's, it's good to see you guys are working on it. Uh, but if you haven't if you haven't worked on it uh, or if you haven't started working on it yet, now now is the time. Uh, you know what they say, you know, the best time to start a long-term project was a month ago. The second best time is today. So uh, so definitely, definitely get started on that. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that's it for my announcements. So I think uh, I think next week, uh, next Tuesday, I'll, I'll, I'll assign the next homework. Um, so it's actually going to be based on this direct stiffness problem stuff. So it's going to be an actual problem set. It's not going to be an answer. Uh, and then you guys will work on that for the next couple of weeks until the midterm exam, uh, which is going to be right before uh, next day. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's it for my announcements. Uh, I was I was in a better mood earlier today because I didn't know NBA started today, but I checked the scores and the Lakers were moving, so I'm not I'm not in as good a mood right now. So you want to just count some class secret football? No, because if I do that, then they're going to lose even more. So. Um, so I I'm superstitious, and if I watch the Lakers, they do that. So I next whole class Sunday. Question, yeah. Yeah, for the next homework, definitely more like an analytical set. 
Exactly. Yeah. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a problem set. We're going to do all hand calculations. Yeah. So so the midterm project. So the midterm projects due next week. We won't see answers for a while because we're going to focus most on the midterm exam. Um, and then after Thanksgiving, then we'll do some more ANSA stuff to wrap up with. Okay. So that's that's kind of the plan for the rest of the semester. Okay. Um, any questions about anything before we uh, get started for today? Two more activities. We have two more activities. Yeah. So I think we'll 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 start one before Thanksgiving, and then we'll do one right after. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. And so what we were uh, focused on before uh, last Thursday was trust equation. Yeah. And so the whole idea with this section is we are solving basically direct fitness problems involving trust elements. <laughs> And so just to kind of remind you, you know, the, the, the direct stiffness method is uh, basically kind of almost like an analytical form of, of how the finite element method works. Okay? Um, and so the way the direct stiffness method uh, works is that, you know, we're going we're to be given a configuration. So it's going to have elements of springs and trusses and eventually beams as well. Um, you're going to compute the element stiffness matrix for each element. You're going to assemble them together into one kind of global linear system. You're going to apply boundary conditions on that system to, to get it into a form that's solvable, and then you're going to solve for the solution you're trying to get. Okay. Okay. And so we're kind of right in the middle of uh, of doing two D problems. And so in two D problems, you know, we have kind of the unique problem where you know each element or each uh, you know um, each truss or each spring can be oriented in a in a different way. Um, and so when we're combining this, when we're, we're when we're going to assemble this in your system, we have to do so under kind of the same kind of stationary coordinate system. And so if you recall from last time, you know, we, we derived the element stiffness matrix for a 2D truss, which involved a lot of cosine and sine terms based on how much that truss element was, was rotating. Okay. Okay. And so let's uh, so let's do an example to kind of illustrate uh, how this works. And so we have a three element system here. And so there's going to be two trusses and a spring. Okay, and so the geometry, I, I believe we started this last time. Let me go ahead and draw it again just for uh, completeness. Okay, we have our initial element A right here. Use lowercase a, just not be confused with cross sectional area A. Okay, so element A here is going to be a, a truss element. Okay. This is going to be connected to element B, which is going to be a spring. So this is going to be element E. And then we have element C here, which is horizontal. And they're all going to converge at this point, um, kind of in the bottom of that. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, so that's the element. So let's go ahead and label all the nodes. So we have node one here in the bottom left. Node two is fixed to the wall. Node three is also fixed to a wall. And node four is also fixed to a wall. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and define the orientations here. So, you know, because we're working with a 2D problem, we have to define their angles. 
Okay, so we'll go ahead and assume that the angle between the spring and the two other elements there are going to be 45 degrees. Okay. And we have to put a mode on this uh, on the structure as well. So we're going to assume we have a mode, a downward mode on, on element, on node one, excuse me. And so that mode is going to be 10,000, um, 10,000 degrees. All right, and so let's go ahead and write out the properties for these elements. So for elements A and C. We have its Young's modulus. So we have E is equal to 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. We have this cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area is 2 inch square. And each of their lengths are going to be 10 feet which is 120 inches. And then for element B, element B is a spring. And so the only property that we need for a spring is the spring constant, okay? And so this can be K is equal to 250,000 uh, pounds per inch. <clears throat> All right, and so what we want to use, or what we want to do, is use the direct stiffness method. We're going to use the direct stiffness method to compute uh, the displacements or the deformations at each node in the structure. All right, and so we're going to follow our typical kind of direct stiffness, um, you know, methodology here. Um, and so we're going to start by computing the element stiffness matrices. We're going to assemble them into a global linear system. Uh, we're going to apply boundary conditions, um, and then we're going to use MATLAB to solve uh, solve for the solution. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. So let's start with the uh, element stiffness matrices. So, so the good thing about the direct stiffness method is that you know it's it's the same process, it's the same methodology for literally every single one of these problems. Um, it's just that you know it, it can get a little bit dull because you know you're doing a lot of calculations um, sometimes you know um, with lots of different angles as as, as well. Okay? But it is the same process. So and so process wise, you know there's not much to learn. Um, it's it's kind of more in the execution. Okay, and actually kind of mo what's more relevant for uh, you know for you guys. Is that when you when we do eventually take the exam on this, which is kind of doing these problems efficiently, uh, you know, just to make sure you get all of it done in time in the exam, is that that's going to be a, a challenge. Okay. But I don't want you to rush. Okay, so you know when you're doing these problems for the first time, don't rush because that's that's how you make the most mistakes. Um, but just you know what I mean is just, just practice it, practice it, and, and get efficient with it, and, and so it, it comes a bit more naturally. But don't rush to use calculators. That's that's where you make uh, most mistakes. Okay, and so we're going to go through each element here, and we're going to compute its element stiffness over here. So let's start with element A. So element A, you can see here, is uh, this one right here, right? So the one that's vertically upwards. And so we have to compute its angle, right? And so when, whenever you're defining the angle for a certain element, right? You're defining its orientation relative to the positive x axis. And so if we look at element A right here, you know, we can see that it's it has an angle of 45 degrees relative to element B. 
but element B is not the horizontal axis, right? So the horizontal axis is actually down where C is. And so the total amount of rotation to get um, that we have in order to go from the horizontal X axis to element A is actually 90 degrees. So that's perhaps I think the hardest part of this problem is, the, is deciding and defining, you know, what the angle of orientation is for each element. And we're going to do another example later today, which kind of shows you, you know, it's sometimes it's not as straightforward as, as, as you think. Okay. And so to make things a little bit simpler, let's go ahead and uh, compute the cosine and sine of this angle because we're about to plug it in a, a ton of times. So we have the cosine of 90 degrees. This is equal to zero in this case. Now we have sine of 90 degrees, which is just And another thing that we'll do before I actually start writing out a matrix is let's compute the quantity EA over L. Okay, so that's the quantity that's in front of the uh, uh, of the element stiffness matrix. Okay, and so we're given those for uh, for this element. And so we have a, a Young's modulus of thirty five cent to the six psi, cross sectional area of two inch squared, and length of one hundred twenty inches. Okay, and so if we compute all those things for this, we get fifty, or excuse me, five times 10 to the uh, fifth pound per inch. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, compute the element stiffness matrix from here. Let me just remind you really quickly what the element stiffness looks like. And so for a 2D truss element, it looks like the following. So we have EA for L. And that gets multiplied by a 4 by 4 matrix. And the 4 by 4 matrix looks like the following. So we have cosine squared, cosine sine, minus cosine squared, or minus cosine, minus, minus cosine squared, minus cosine squared, and then minus cosine sine. Second row starting from the diagonal entry is going to be sine squared minus cosine sine minus sine squared. And here we have uh, in the third row starting from the diagonal entry, we have cosine squared and then cosine sine. And then the last row on the diagonal entry is just sine squared. All right, so this form here is, is, is a little bit different from what I presented to you uh, last week. Okay, so last week I kind of filled out the entire matrix. But the reason I put it in this form is just to kind of highlight to you or highlight the fact that this matrix here is symmetric, right? And so as soon as you kind of fill out the upper half of this of this matrix, you can then fill out the bottom uh, the bottom half, you know, just by just by transposing it. So this part here is, is symmetric. Okay. So let's go ahead and plug this uh, plug this in. So we have the element stiffness for element A. Okay. All right. So the good news here is that you know, the majority of these quantities here are going to be zero because we have cosine of the angle here is, is actually equal to zero. And so anything that has a cosine in there, we're just going to plug in zero for that, right? Whether it's cosine squared or cosine sine, right? Because cosine sine is zero times one in this case, which is still uh, zero. Okay, so first let's plug in EA over L. So EA over L up front is five times 10 to the fifth. Okay. And then we're gonna plug in uh, the values here. So let's start with the first row. So the first row we have cosine squared, which is zero. We have cosine sine. And so cosine sine is also zero. We have minus cosine squared, so that's also gonna be zero. And then minus cosine sine also zero. And so we're going to take that first row and then write it into the first column. Right? So remember that's that's kind of the trick that we talked about last time. Kind of save yourself a little bit of work. Okay. And so as soon as you finish a row, just go ahead and write it down into that same column. Um, you know, just because we know that this element stiffness matrix is symmetric. 
Okay, so then we have a second row. And so the second row, we have a sine squared. So sine squared is one. Then we have minus cosine sine. So minus cosine sine is going to be zero. And then we have a minus sine squared, which is going to be minus one. All right, and then once again, we're going to write this down into the column. And so we're going to have a zero minus one uh, in the bottom. All right, and so we get to the third row. So third row, we have cosine squared and cosine sine. Both of those are going to be zero. And so we have zero, zero. And then we write this down into the column. And so since we have a zero on the far right, that means we have a zero down there as well. Okay. And then finally, we get to the last entry in the matrix, which is sine squared. And so that's going to give us a value of one. All right. So that right there is the elements difference matrix for element. So it's a lot of it's a lot of bugging and chugging, but you know, um, eventually if you just keep chugging away, then you'll get to the uh, get to the answer. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to element B. Okay, so the first thing with element B is we need to uh, we need to define its angle orientation, so its angle theta. Okay, and so let's go ahead and scroll back up to the, to the figure. And so you can see based on this figure here that its angle orientation is going to be forty five degrees. Okay? And so if we start from the positive x axis, and so we start from a horizontal line, and we rotate up into the orientation for element B, you can see that that's forty five degrees. Based on what's what's given in the paper. Okay, so for element B, our theta in this case is going to be 45 degrees. Our cosine, we take cosine of 45 degrees, that's going to give us root 2 over 2. And then sine of 45 degrees is also root 2 over 2. Okay. So technically speaking, you know, we, we haven't gone over, you know, what the element stiffness matrix for a 2D spring looks like, uh, but it's, it's going to look almost identical to that of a, of a truss, okay? The only difference here is, is what is the factor that's out in front, okay? And so for a 2D truss, you know, the factor that's out in front is the Young's modulus times its cross-sectional area divided by its length, which is, you know, what we talked about is kind of like their effective spring cost. But for a spring, you know, we don't have to have an effective spring constant. We just have the spring constant. And so the, the thing that's out in front here is just going to be the spring constant K, which is confusing because I'm, I'm using K for a lot of different things. So let's go ahead and just plug in the value for the spring constant that we're given in the problem. Okay. And so the problem we're given a spring constant of 250,000 pound per inch. Okay. And so 250,000 is 2.5 times 10 to the fifth. And then let's go ahead and plug in the, uh, uh, the values for our trees. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated because we don't have a zero here, uh, but we do have a lot of symmetry. Right? And so uh, what we're lucky is that is that cosine squared is equal to cosine sine, which is equal to sine squared in this case. Okay. Because both cosine and sine of, of 45 degrees is root 2 over 2. And so if we take root two over two times root two over two, no matter what combination that we, we take it in, we get one half. Okay. Okay. And so our element stiffness matrix here is going to have a lot of one halves. The only thing that we have to pay attention to is just the sine. Okay. okay. So let's start with the first row. And so the first row is going to be cosine squared, uh, cosine times sine. Times minus cosine squared times minus cosine times sine. So this would be one half, positive one half, minus one half, minus one half. Okay. And just like we did last time, let's go ahead and write this into the first column. So we have one half, minus one half, minus one half. So you're basically taking every entry in the first row and just kind of, you know, kind of almost rotating it down into the first column. Okay. All right, 
right. So now we have the second row in the matrix. So the second row is going to be sine of positive sine squared. So that's going to be a one half. Then we have a minus cosine sine. So minus cosine sine is going to be a minus one half. And we have a minus sine squared, which is a minus one. And so once again, I'm going to write this down into columns with a minus one half. All right, so now we come to the third row. And so for the third row, we have a positive cosine squared. So positive cosine squared is going to be a one half. And then we have a positive cosine max sine, which is going to be a positive one half. Okay. And then we write that last entry down to the third column. So we have just a positive one half. And then finally, we get to the bottom right entry, which is just a positive sine squared. So we're just going to do a positive. Okay, and so that's the elements difference matrix for element three. So two out of three, uh, two out of three. Done. That one's a little bit more work, but uh, you know, still not, still not terrible. All right, any questions? Yes. Um, is it better, like the sake of making it, I guess, visually easier to look at? Maybe also just factor out the one time. Yep. Divided by. Uh, of course, yeah, you can you can definitely do that. And so in the case where you have a forty five degrees, you're going to have basically all one halves in the, in the matrix, and so you can definitely factor it out, just make everything ones, and then just uh, this factor in front will become one point two five times ten. Um, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right. All right, and so uh, we have one more element here, but it's kind of more or less the same. So you know, I'm just going to speed with this. We'll write it down just for the sake of completeness. Okay, so if we look at element C, we can see that element C is already kind of horizontal, right? And so we don't have to rotate at all in order to get it into its orientation. And so the theta for this case is actually going to be zero. Okay, so cosine of zero is uh, one. And sine of zero is zero. And so we have another easy case here. So we're going to have a lot of zeros and some ones that are in Okay. So our element stiffness matrix for element C, we have five times 10 to the fifth. That's a factor of, uh, of EA over L out front. And then, um, the entries in the matrix are as follows. So we have cosine squared, which is a one. We have cosine times sine, which is a zero. We have a minus cosine squared, so that's minus one. And then a cosine, a minus cosine sine, so that's going to be zero. Once again, I'm going to write this down into the first column. So we have zero, minus one, zero. Okay. Our next row contains all terms that have a sum. So we have zeros all the way across. And zeros in the second column as well. <clears throat> For the third row, we have a one in diagonal entry because that's a positive cosine squared, and zero because that is a cosine sine, <clears throat> and then the zero down there. And the last entry is going to be a zero at um, the bottom right because that is a uh, sine squared. All right, so that is the element stiffness matrix. Right. So we have our, our three element stiffness matrices here. Okay. But I, I, I just realized just now that we, we did forget something. Okay. Because in addition to the element stiffness matrices, remember that you also have to indicate which nodes these elements are connected to. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and add, I'm just going to add them to our element stiffness matrices. Okay. So for element A, let's go back to the figure here. And we can see that element A here is connected to nodes one and two. And so to reflect that, let's go ahead and multiply our element stiffness matrix here by D1x, say D1x. D1x, D1y, D1x, D1x, D1y, and then element, and then node two, so D2x, D2y. Okay. So let's go ahead and add those up. 
that's a little bit. So now, so now we know what nodes are connected to element A from its elements to this. <clears throat> okay. For element B, if we go back to the figure here, we can see that element B is connected to nodes one and three. Okay. And so we're going to say u one x regarding u. Where's it have it? Okay. D one x, D one y. And then we have D3X, D3Y. That's because element B is connected to nodes uh, one and three. Okay, so that's why we have one and three. All right, and then finally for element C here, we can see from the figure that it's connected to nodes one on the left and node four on the right. And so, it's going to be D1x, D1y, 4x, D4y. Okay. All right, so now that we have the values of the element sickness matrix for every element and we have the nodes that it's connected to, uh, we're ready to start assembling the global, global system. All right, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay, no question, yes. Wait, so the, the like cosine sign that's been you know, you know where this is element is good mismatrix, it's always gonna be that exactly cosine sine squared. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So the so the so the arrangement of the cosine and sine that's always gonna be the same, but depending on the angle for your element, then the, the values okay. of the cosine are gonna be different. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's get to a sentence. So this is so this is the uh, well, it's it's certainly a part. Whether it's interesting or fun, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to you guys. <laughs> okay, and so we're going to assemble this all into one system. Okay? So let's let's first kind of decide, you know, how many how many entries or how big our global system is going to be. Okay, and so we have four nodes in the system. Three of them are, are fixed, and so that, that's actually the simple part. It's quite a bit. But you know, we're going to start with the whole system here. Okay, so we have four nodes. Each of them is going to have an x and y component of its uh, of its deformation. And so each has an uh, each has an x and y component. That means we have uh, eight. We have eight entries overall, right? So four nodes, two components of deformation. So that means our global system will be eight by eight, eight rows and eight columns. So this is going to be quite a uh, quite a doozy. Okay. So I'm going to probably take up this entire uh, page here. So let's start with this. So let's go down the rows first. So we're going to have D1x, D1y, D2x, D2y, D3x, D3y, D4x, D4y. Okay. So we have our four nodes, nodes one, two, three, and four, and then x and y components of its deformation at each node. And then just for uh, you know, just for convenience, I'm going to go ahead and write up write them into the columns too. And so our first column is going to be D1x, second column is going to be D1y, third column is D2x, D2y, D3x, D3y, D4x. So good. Actually, uh, the dimensions actually worked out pretty, pretty well. Okay. And so the right hand side, you know, we'll, we'll worry about in a second. But let me just go ahead and tell you what it is uh, for now. Okay. And so remember, on the other side of the matrix equations, we're going to do our global forcing equation: f1x, f1y, f1y, 
got two X. Got two Y. Got three X. Got three Y. Got four X and F four. Okay, but we'll, we'll worry about that in a second. So the, fir the first step here is going to be just to uh, insert all of our elements in. All right, so we have quite a lot to do here. So we have uh, an eight by eight matrix that has 64 entries. So we have, to, we have to find the values for 64, you know, entries in this. Place. All right, so let's, let's start at least by highlighting the areas that we're going to. All right, so I'm going to start with element A. So element A we know is acting on node 22. And so luckily nodes 1 and 2 are right next to each other in the matrix. So we can just kind of highlight this one big 4x4 four four box. And so that's going to be the first four rows and the first four columns of the uh, matrix. So next, let's go. Uh, let's go element B. Okay, element B. We know element B is working on nodes one and. So we're going to have to break up element uh, B a little bit because you know one and three are not right next to each other in the matrix. Okay. Okay. So let's let's we'll do this in kind of sections of two by two minutes. So we'll start with uh, node one, node one. Okay. And so that's going to be this uh, this box right here. Okay. Then we have a two by two block that corresponds to you know D one X D one Y D three X D three Y. Okay, so that's going to be the first two rows and the sixth and seventh columns, or excuse me, the fifth and sixth columns. Will be these right here. Then we have the same thing but kind of flipped. So we have the fifth and sixth columns and the first and second. Uh, so fifth and sixth rows, and then the uh, first and second columns. These by the two there. And then we have the third, the fifth and sixth uh, rows, and the fifth and sixth columns. So that's going to be the other two. All right, and then our last uh, element stiffness matrix for element C. We know element C is connected to nodes one and four. So we're going to highlight those areas in the global stiffness system as well. And so there, there is, a, in this case, a big party on node one. So we're going to draw another box here. So we're going to have quite a lot of overlapping terms on that, on that node one right there. And then we have the cross terms, so the things that interact between nodes one and node four, which are the top right of this, uh, of this matrix. And so the seventh and eighth columns in the first and second rows. Then we have the seventh and eighth uh, uh, row in the first and second column. So let's give you this part of the And then we have the seventh and eighth row, the seventh and eighth column. So we have this two by two section. Here. Okay. All right. And so now the next part is just to fill everything in. Uh, but before we do that, let's let's go ahead and fill in all the empty space. So everything that's not boxed by uh, by an element stiffness matrix, we know we can take the value of zero. Let's go ahead and fill in all our zeros here. Uh, 
And then let's start filling in the other entries. All right, but so far, does it does it kind of make sense in terms of what we've highlighted in the in the global stiffness uh, global stiffness matrix? Yeah, this is so this is the part that you know once we start doing 2D problems, you have to kind of think a little bit in terms of you know what parts am I highlighting and, and do they correspond to the right to the right entries? Yeah. Uh, because you know, just 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 the pure fact that each node has an X and Y component. Uh, does actually kind of make things quite a bit complicated. So, you know, instead of node two being on row two, you see node two here is actually rows three and four. So, uh, you know, make sure you do this part carefully because it's it's, it's very it's very easy to kind of uh, miss 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 a line or miss uh, you know, miss something here, um, and then you're going to get something kind of included. Okay, yeah. Is the matrix of this size going to be any of this time? Uh, it might be. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not making solve solve a matrix of this size, but you should at least be able to assemble a matrix of this size. Assemble and apply that. Okay, so let's go ahead and start adding numbers in. But uh, let me do one step here just to make it a little bit more readable on this side. Okay, and so if you look at all of our element stiffness matrices, they all have a factor of like something times ten to the ten, ten to the fifth on the other side. Okay, and so just to make our lives a little bit easier, I'm going to take a uh, factor out that 10 to the fifth, okay? And so if you didn't see what I just wrote, I wrote a 10 to the fifth you know, out here up on the left-hand side, okay? So I'm just factoring that out in front just to make our lives a little bit easier so we don't have to keep writing five times 10 to the fifth, five times 10 to the fifth, okay? All right, and so let's go ahead and start writing in the, uh, the numbers. Okay, so for element A, so let's start in the top, uh, let's start, well, I guess we can write the whole thing. Okay, so element A, I'm going to use red here. So we can have a zero, 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 zero. And we have a zero. We have a one, okay? But that one is multiplied by five times 10 to the fifth. So we factor out a 10 to the fifth. And so that leaves us with just a factor of five here, okay? Zero times five. And we have zero, 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 zero. And then our final row here is going to be zero times five, zero, and five. Okay. Let's do element, uh, element B. All right, so element B had, had a bunch of one halves out in front. Uh, but if we factor out that one half, that means our factor in the middle there is going to be 1.2. Okay. So this will actually get a little bit annoying because we have to write down a, a bunch of 1.25s. Okay. Uh, well, let's go ahead and do that. And so at the top left here, we're going to have a positive 1.25. And remember, whenever you have overlapping entries, you just add just add whatever's there together. Okay. So we have a positive 1.25 on each entry here. And from there, it gets a little bit less crowded. Because, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I used the wrong. I used the wrong color. So element 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 B is actually purple. Sorry about that. Okay. Hopefully, you guys caught it and used the right colors. Okay. Plus five. Plus five. All right, and so for the parts that don't overlap, it's going to be a lot cleaner. So you have a minus 1.25 here, minus 1.25, minus 1.25, minus 1.25. Okay. And the bottom left, we have a minus 1.25, And the bottom right here, we have a positive 1.5, 5, five. and 1.2. All right. So now, now we get to baby. So now let's go ahead and add all the entries. Okay. All right. And so if we look at our matrix here, we can, can split this up into, you know, 
quadrants like this. Okay. And then each of these quadrants are going to go to a different section of the, of the global stiffness channel system. Okay, so let's look at the top left quadrant first. So that's a positive one. So that's going to be a plus five here. Okay. And we have plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. And then we get to the top top right entry in the matrix, and then we have a minus five, and then zero, zero, zero. Then we go to the bottom left, and then we have a minus five, zero, zero, zero. And then the bottom right, we have a positive five, and zero, zero, zero. So on, it's water writing, so I'll, I'll give everyone just a, a minute just to kind of write it. It definitely helps, you know, when, when you're first doing these is, is to have different colors. And so if you're writing notes on an iPad, uh, definitely make use of the different color pens just to highlight the different elements. Uh, but if not, you know, if you're writing on, on kind of traditional paper, just try, just try to kind of keep track and see where each of the numbers are. And of course, you know, you'll have the lecture recordings to kind of refer to. All right, uh, so while people are writing, uh, writing this down, are there, are there any questions on how we got everything in this matrix here? Yeah. Sorry, just how did you get the 1.25? Wasn't it 2.5 earlier? It was 2.5, but we had all uh, one halves in the, in the matrix. And so I took that one half and I just kind of pulled that up. Ah, okay. So it's 2.5 divided by 2. Good question. Okay. All right, and so this is our this is our assembled matrix here. And so of course the next step here is to apply boundary conditions. All right. And so after we apply boundary conditions, you're going to be very upset with a lot of this, a lot of this matrix is actually going to go down. And so for this particular problem, we have, uh, we actually have three fixed supports. So we have a fixed support on node two. We have a fixed support on node three. And a fixed support on node four. Okay, so two, three, and four are all fixed. And what a fixed support, remember what that tells us is that the deformations at these nodes are all going to be zero. So D2x is equal to D2y, which is zero. D3x is equal to D3y, which is zero. D4x is equal to D4y, which is equal to zero. Okay. All right. And so what that means is that, you know, all, all of these rows in the matrix, so all of the rows that correspond to no two, no three, no four, they're all basically going to be wiped out. Okay, so we're going to replace all of those rows in, in the matrix. So let me go ahead and I'm going to change my color to orange here. I'm going to go ahead and make the change into all of those rows in the matrix. Okay. So let's start with the D2X row. So D2X right now is actually all zeros, right? So if you look, if you look at that in row three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all these entries here in, in row three. Okay. And I'm going to erase F2X on the on the right hand side as well, which forces that here. Okay. And so I'm going to replace this with uh, what we typically do for these boundary conditions. So for the boundary conditions for a uh, for a, a constraint type boundary condition. Uh, we're going to put zeros on the entire row, with the exception of the diagonal entry. So the diagonal entry, in this case, the third row, is going to be the third column. Okay, we're going to put a one on the third column. Orange is a little bit hard to see on there. Let me use use green. Okay. And 
And so that third row is going to look like this. Okay. And so we're going to have 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then on the right hand side, we're going to have a 0 there for, because we're setting the displacement there to be 0. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing for row four. So row four corresponds to D2Y. So that's also going to be constrained by the fixed support. Okay. So we're going to have 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. okay. So we're going to do the same thing for D3X. So D3X, we're going to just eliminate this entire row. We have 0, 0, 0, 0. Since we're in the fifth row, we're going to put a 1 on the fifth column. It's also going to be zero on the right hand side. Same thing for the next row. So for the sixth row, we're going to erase all of these. This is cross here. We're going to zero, 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 one, zero, zero, and a zero on the right hand side. Think for the next row. So for the next row, we're going to have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Zero on the right hand side. And then finally, we're going to have the same for the last row. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So 75% of the hard work that we just did assembling our matrix is now gone. All right, so you, so you might be wondering, you know, and so, you know, if you look at this problem, you know, from the beginning, before before you wrote down any matrices, right, it's it's very obvious that, you know, that nodes, that nodes two, three, and four are going to end up like this, that they're, they're fixable, right? So there's no way that they're going to have any deformation because they're, they're fixable. And so the question I always get is, you know, can can you kind of skip to this, right? Can you can you skip to kind of this result? Uh, and so for a, you know, I would say when you're first starting out, when you're doing these problems first, you know, don't skip to the step. So I would I would go through the whole the entire you know problem of assembling the whole thing, getting your, your matrix in that way, um, and then on the next step, you know, I would even rewrite your matrix, then write your boundary conditions. Because um, you know, you may recall, you know, um, this this was a few lectures ago. I mean, two or three lectures ago, we talked about the possibility of computing the reaction forces at all those points. Okay? And so, to compute the reaction forces at the supports, you know, you, you actually do need that matrix before you apply the boundary conditions. Okay? Because the way that we have, uh, obtained those reaction forces was, was we took our deformation solution, we multiplied by our fully assembled matrix before applying the boundary conditions. And then you know, that result gave us the reaction. So now, I would recommend that you that you do that first. Okay. Um, but you know, as you kind of get better at these problems and you start to see like, oh, you know, I don't need the reaction forces in this case, then yes, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to force you to write you know. And this is not as bad as it can get sometimes too. So I think on the homework I have a uh, uh, a five node system. So that's going to be a ten by ten. That's one hundred entries that you have to write. You know, I'm not going to force you guys to make, make you write that even several times. So, you know, for problems like that, yes, you, you, kind of, you can kind of skip a couple of steps and get to this course. But, you know, make sure that you kind of know what you're doing because, you know, kind of the more steps that you skip, you know, the more likely it is that you're going to make a mistake. And as, as, as much of a pain as it is to write these down, if you're not getting the right answer and you have to look through your work to try to find where you made the mistake, that's an even bigger pain. So that's, and that's made even more painful if you kind of skip steps and so on. Kind of the more steps that you write down, and, and you know, if you do make a mistake, it becomes easier to kind of find. So, you know, I know, I know it's a pain. I know it's a lot to write down. But you know, when you're first doing these, you know, I really encourage you guys to you know, go through all the motions, do all the steps, um, you know, because you're going to make mistakes, and it's a lot easier to kind of find your mistakes when you have everything kind of written down, as opposed to just kind of jumping to jumping jumping steps and, and trying to find trying to find your error. And that is is it's impossible. It's almost impossible. It's, it's even hard for me to kind of look at, look at this. Okay. All right. 
So that is our, that's all our pick supports there. Okay. And so the last thing we have to add here is our, is our mode. So actually the load is actually a pretty easy case. So if you look back at our original diagram here, we have a load in the Y direction, right at node one, okay? And so this tells us that F1Y is gonna be equal to 10,000 pounds, okay? And since we have no load in the X direction, F1X is gonna be equal to zero, okay? So let's go ahead and apply those to our matrix. Okay. And so you can see here, we conveniently have F1X and F1Y. And so for F1X, we know F1X is going to be zero. And F1Y is going to be a minus 10,000 pounds. So we put a minus 10,000 because we because the mode is being applied in the negative, in the negative direction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And so that's it. And so you know, now that we have the matrix here, all the boundary conditions are applied, we are ready to solve this. And so if we solve this system in that, and so we get the following results. So D1X, Y. So D1X in this case is going to be 0 0.0033 inches. D1Y is going to be a minus 0. 0, 0.0167 inches. Okay. And then for all of the other deformations, they're all going to be zero uh, because these are these are all fixed supports. All right, so there is your there's your final answer. Question? Yes. Yeah, I have a dumb question. You just uh, one multiply the the transpose matrix of your the forces, right? To get the solution to the deformation. Ah, so so in MATLAB, the, the way the way I typically do this, so you can solve this in a graphing calculator too. But basically what we have here is, is a left-hand side matrix. So we have kind of a very large uh, linear system. And so I, I usually define one uh, variable in, in, uh, in MATLAB to do this. So this is like our global stiffness. And so you can define the matrix kind of in, in that way. Right? So you can, you, can tip, you can typically do it in one line of code. Um, it's going to be quite messy that way, but you can do that. And then the other thing you have to define here is the right-hand side forcing factor. So this is going to be a, a column vector, which I usually call B. And so I define that in code as well. And once you have those two defined, then the, the way to solve this is you use the backslash operation, A backslash B. And so backslash is kind of a special operator in that method that, that says, you know, basically give me the, 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 the solution to this matrix. So the only thing you have to define is just the matrix and the force. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on, on this example? Yeah. So uh, if, if we were to have this on the homework, would you allow us to use MATLAB to make, yes. like, well, I mean, to make a, uh, like to make KA, KB, and KC, oh, and then right. add them and like show screenshots of the matrices instead of writing out. Sure, sure. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if, if you're savvy with MATLAB and, and you can do that, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you will have to kind of write it down by hand because on the exam, you're going to have to write it down by hand. But to save you time in the homework, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions on uh, this? Okay. All right, so that so that took a little bit more time than I thought, but I did. I, I at least wanted to start the next example because the next example um, has some kind of interesting aspects to it that are uh, that are a little bit different. Right, so maybe we'll start this example today and then we'll finish it up really quickly on Thursday uh, before we move on. Okay. okay. So that that last example was was kind of a doozy just in terms of just the amount of uh, computation that we had to do. 
This one's a little bit easier. So this one's only a three node system uh, and only two elements, uh, but there are some factors here that we, that we haven't seen. Okay, so let's look at this uh, two element structure. Okay, so we're gonna have a fixed support up top. Both of these are gonna be trusses, so we're not gonna do any springs here. And so our two elements are gonna to come together and come into a point like that, okay? But on this support here, we're not gonna have a fixed support. What we're gonna have instead is a roller support. And so the way we treat that roller support mathematically is gonna be a little different than, uh, you know, than, than, than normal. We'll, we'll kind of see what that looks like. Okay, okay so let's go ahead and label, uh, label the structures. We'll call the top element element A. Let's go ahead and label the nodes. So we're gonna have node one here where they meet. Node two is going to be the node at the top. And then node three is going to be on the roller support. Okay. okay, so the length of element A we're going to assume is 10 feet. The length of uh, element B here is going to be assumed to be 5 feet. The angle between these two elements is going to be 30 degrees. And we're going to assume that they have the same Young's modulus. So the Young's modulus is going to be 30 times 10 to the 6 psi. And we're going to assume they have the same cross-sectional area A, which is 1 inch. This applies to both elements. All right, and so just uh, and so just like the previous example, what we're going to do is we're going to compute, or we're going to use the direct stiffness method. We're going to use the direct stiffness method to compute the deformations of each of each node in the structure. All right, so we're going to follow the exact same process that we've uh, that we followed with, uh, with this one. So there's 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 some interesting um, you know twists on, on this problem that we haven't seen before. Some are obvious, and so one obviously is going to be the roller support, uh, but there are a couple of kind of more uh, you know not so obvious kind of twists uh, compared to this one. Okay, but well, we're going to start the way that we always do. So let's go ahead and uh, and start by computing the element stiffness matrices for each element. Okay, so we'll start with element A. Okay, so element A we know is connected to nodes one and two. So let's let's make sure that we write that into the element statement matrix. Okay, and then we need to determine its angle. Okay. okay. So here's where things get a little bit tricky, at least compared to before. Okay? And so uh, from the figure here, you know, it's it's very tempting to use an angle of 30 degrees for this for this element. Right? And so we what we've talked about before is that the angle that you that you define here is the angle at which the you know the angle is, is the element the angle at which the element is rotated from the horizontal line. Okay. And so we can see from this figure here that element B is horizontal. And so we can see that element A is actually, you know, 30 degrees up from that point. Okay? And so it's very tempting to input 30 degrees for this, for this angle. But what I'm going to tell you is that it's not 30 degrees. It's, it's a close cousin of 30 degrees, but it's not 30. Okay? Instead, the angle 
is going to be 150 degrees. And so you're probably wondering, you know, how, how the heck did I get 150 degrees? Yeah. Remember, you know, this, this angle here, you know, defines the orientation of the element relative to the positive x-axis. What I didn't tell you before was that the positive x-axis is defined, or it's, it's drawn, from the lower number of nodes. So what do, what do I mean by that? So let me let me go ahead and draw element A here separately so you can kind of see. Okay. So this is element A, and we know the bottom, the bottom right node is node one, and the top left node is node two. Okay. All right. And so in order to get the, the proper angle for this, we need to go to the lower numbered node and draw the positive x-axis from there. Okay. And so the lower number node here is node one. Okay. So we're going to draw the positive x axis going outwards. Like that. Okay. All right. And so to rotate, or to in order to get this element into the orientation that it's uh, that's in, we're going to rotate as if node one here was the pivot. And so you know we're we're gonna we're basically gonna imagine that if, if the lower number node that's where the positive x-axis is, and that's the that's kind of the pivot for our rotation. Okay, in order to get this element into its its orientation, we have to rotate an amount by x. Okay. So you're gonna have to use a little bit of trigonometry, a little bit of uh, of, of you know of, of angles and degrees here to kind of get the right angle, right? Because what we're given in the problem. We kind of extend this axis out. We're given that the angle that it makes, kind of with the kind of the opposite of that, is thirty degrees. Okay. And if we know that if we make a complete turn here, okay, a complete turn here would be one hundred eighty degrees. Okay. That means if we were to stop thirty degrees short, the angle that we're actually looking for here is one hundred fifty. Okay. That would mean that only Exactly. Yeah, we'll get we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. So the angle that we're looking for here for element A is actually one fifty. Okay. And so you want to be you want to be careful with that. And so I think this is kind of the number one place where people make mistakes on on these uh, on these problems is you know not um, you know seeing the um, the perfect angle. Okay. And so with that, um, you know, let's let's look very quickly at element B here. Okay. Because element B is very simple, so it's it's very tempting, right? And so element B, you can see the lower number node is node one that's on the right. Whereas the higher number node number three is on the left. Right? And so if we were to draw the positive x axis going on outwards like, like that, okay, in order to rotate into the proper position, we'd actually have to rotate by 180 degrees. Okay? And so the theta for element B is going to be 180. And so this actually makes a difference because this this is actually going to change the signs of your sine and cosine terms, and so you know your your matrix is going to have negatives in, in different places compared to its kind of default. Okay. Um, so yes. Yeah. Uh, when you did the first one for a, I when I thought you when you said use the lower node, I thought you meant like lower as in like on on the. On the y axis. Ah, yeah, no, it, it's the lower number. So, which, because uh, each of the nodes are numbered, so whichever one has the lower number, that's going to be the pivot, and that's where you're going to rotate the curve. I thought the numbers were just like placed to reference them, though. They are. 
They are, but uh, but then you know once and, and the numbering is, is also kind of arbitrary. So you know for, for all the problems that I'll give you, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the node numberings. But you could easily do the problem in a different way, and you can number the nodes differently. You know it's, it's going to change how you define the angles and stuff. But in the end, you're still you're going to get the same result as long as you stay kind of consistent with that numbering all throughout. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and write out, uh, we'll write out the element stiffness matrix. Well, we probably do both. Okay, so for theta is equal to 150 degrees. Unfortunately, this is a very annoying, this is a very annoying uh, number here, okay? Because cosine of 150 is gonna be a minus root three over two, and then sine of 150. Is going to be one half. And so we're actually going to have to think quite a lot uh, in, in computing, especially because we have a negative cosine there. Uh, so that's going to change things. Uh, quite a bit. Okay, so let's go ahead and write this down. Okay, so the element stiffness matrix for element A, uh, if we take the product of uh, its Young's modulus and its area divided by its length, then we should get 2.5. Out per inch. So that's going to be the factor out in front. Okay. And so in the top left entry of the matrix, we have a cosine squared. So we have a minus root 3 over 2 times a minus root 3 over 2. And so that's going to be a positive root 4. Top left. Next to that, we have a positive cosine times sine. And so cosine is a minus root three over two times sine, which is one half. And so this is going to give us a minus root three over four. Okay. So you can see here, we, we kind of flip the sign because you know, cosine, cosine is negative. Because you know, if you look at the previous problem, the first two entries were always positive in one case. Okay. And so you have to be really careful with the sign. So getting the angle correct is, is really important. Okay. So next we have a minus cosine squared, so the minus, um, we have three minuses here. So we have a minus root three over two times minus root three over two, and that's a minus one. So it gives us a minus three fourths. And then in the top right, we have a minus cosine times sine. So if we work that out, we get a positive root three over two. And so from here, uh, I'm going to do the same trick that I normally do. So now that we've kind of done the hard work for the first row, let's go ahead and, and copy that into the first column. So this is going to be a minus root 3 over 4, minus 3 over 4, root 3 over 4. Okay. So we have the first row and the first column complete. And we move on to the next row. So the next row, we have a sine squared. So sine squared can be one half times one half. So it's going to be a positive one fourth. Then we have a minus uh, cosine times sine. So that's going to be a positive root three over four. And then we have a minus sine squared. So minus sine squared would be minus one fourth. Once again, I'm going to write this as columns, root three over four, minus one over four. All right. Then for the third row in the diagonal entry, we have a cosine squared. So cosine squared can be root three over four. And then we have a positive cosine times sine. So that's be minus root three over four. Write that down into the column. Minus root three over four, right? We'll know that. And then finally, in the bottom right, we have a sine squared, so that's going to be a positive one. Let's not forget the node. So it's going to be 1x, d1y, d2x. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? 
And so that is our element series. So when you, when you have, uh, so I'm, I'm never, I'm never going to give you a, a weird angle like 36 degrees or something like that. I'm always going to give you, you know, either 30 degrees, 45 degrees or 60 degrees, just because, you know, otherwise that would be madness. <laughs> so, um, and so the worst it's going to get is, is something like this. We have 30 or 50 degrees. Um, you have to deal with kind of root three over two. Okay. I remember the first semester I contemplated giving a problem with, with an angle of like 37 degrees. And I tried doing it myself. I'm like, this is bad. So I, I changed it to 45. So, um, yeah. Um, so, you know, in case you're wondering, every problem that I assign you, I do it myself. And so, you know, if it's too much for me, I think it's, it's pretty, much, pretty, pretty sure it's going to be pretty too much for me. Okay. Uh, so, before we go, let's uh, let's do element P really quickly. Element P is actually very fast. As we know, the angle in this case is 180 degrees. So we know cosine of 180 is uh, going to be minus 1, and sine of 180 is going to be 0. So we're in luck. So anytime we have a 0, either for sine or cosine, it's going to simplify our element series to make this quite a bit. Okay, so for element stiffness matrix, for element B, uh, if we take the product of EA over L, that's going to be five times sent to the fifth, not to inch. Okay. Then we have our element stiffness matrix here with the odd of zeros. So it's one, zero, minus one, zero. We write that into the problem. We have zero minus one, zero. Next row is all zeros, and so, so we'll get column B. And then our last two um, you know, rows will be one, zero, and then zero. All right. And then this node here is connected to nodes one and three. So we have E1X, one x one y Ex. If you have either zero or 90 degrees or 180 degrees or 270 degrees, uh, you know, the only stiffness matrix is very bad. It's going to be you know, a lot of this. Going to be just, just, just. All right. Any questions on this before we uh, wrap it up for, for today? Okay. All right. So that's it for today. Uh, and so on Thursday, we'll, we'll go ahead and finish up this example. There's one There's one more final thing I want to talk about in terms of the roller support that we'll definitely talk about. Uh, and then we'll move on to beams after that. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the evening, and I will see you guys on Thursday. You know, you know, it's uh, 30 seconds. Yeah. 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 No, so because uh, we have all one test for the I think they said just back to us to get all one. Everything's
See, if you would have bought the boys one but, Little C's pizza, we could have yeah, done everything. Oh, one Mexican pizza. Oh, one Mexican pizza. Yeah, that Marvin and Dylan can kill in one freaking city. The side of a Mexican pizza, he can move anything for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's still, it's still going to be uh, across the country, but it's, it's, I mean, that's the kind of thing with these complex models. That right now? Kind of, even with that being, well, yeah, that's not so. <laughs> I already how feel much, the whole thing. How much it's Because it's such a thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. Right. I have the way of others. That's the the parameters, the so I can say the answer. So the main, the main, you know, the main, the main thing is you know, try to get the fixed supports away from your very parts. Okay. From the fixed supports, these are the weird. Well, I'm going to tell them between these two. Try to far away. 
and then you kind of see what's happening there. Right? And then you can kind of do what they're talking about. Other things, 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 yeah, uh, so I hope my mission design review is coming out pretty yeah, decent. Yeah, right. so. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. Then, 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 I mean, no, I don't want to get so Yeah, appreciate it. Did you ask him? Uh, I was, did the simulation wrong? I did my upper row. First, yeah, so I made a fixed port at the bottom and then the load at top, but it's a thousand newton load, so it's 100 kilograms. Sure, worse than yeah. sure. And yeah. Where so my holes are, there's absolutely not. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that makes sense. sense. No, it's not. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, I, I presented this. Yeah, you saw, yeah, yeah. No one said nothing. No one said nothing. Oh, yeah. I know this is like behind but... this side of it and been like, yeah, yeah. 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 Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Yeah. I got a factor of safety of 15 plus, and I, I yeah. had like 15 yeah. pounds. Oh, yeah. yeah. okay, so that's brought us out. I don't want you guys to ride the rover to change the side. That's that's okay. Yeah, yeah, so I'm talking about we do the answers really on this, and then hopefully, and hopefully oh, yeah. we can know oh, yeah. where I can that's, have smaller diameter. No, I'm not just saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like everyone's going to be like, oh, yeah. It's like, what are you going to change this year? Oh, wait. And they'll be like, that's it. It's like, no, bro, you have to point it. So, whenever we cure, you cut costs, you cut time with buying factory. Yeah, that's right. I'm making the priority of that. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, that's So you can do two, so two configurations can be like that. Yeah, so, so okay. and so one and two can be same, exact same force with exact same um, fixed supports, but different material. Oh, but for your third configuration, I do want to change in the boundary condition. Mostly just because you know when you change the material, you know, what you're gonna see is that the deformations and the stresses, yeah, the values are gonna be different, but the but the distribution is gonna be exactly the same. Uh, unless you use a non-linear material. Because the third one I was gonna do was very acrobatic. Yeah, so so that's usually what I tell people. So I think for most people, I think you know, if you're doing the bracket of a propeller or something like that, people the first boundary condition that people think of is kind of like what I call a typical use case. Um, and then for the second configuration, people are usually struggling with that. But then I what I tell people is that you think of kind of like an emergency situation, like the worst case scenario. Yeah, so like for the propeller, you know, hitting a rock is perfect. So that would be kind of the worst case. Yeah, first of all, you would be like scale and then you know, yeah, fix support and then
Yeah, so actually, so for this one, you know, what people usually do that they imagine there's kind of a rod that's kind of going through here. Yeah. Um, and then, right, and so, but maybe that rod would attach to like a pulley or something. And so that rod would be actually put a linear force, maybe in like kind of an oblique direction. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Um, or maybe you might have a case where you have a lot of friction, because the bearing because it makes very frictionless really, yeah. right? But maybe there's a lot of friction going this way. So maybe you put a force going in that direction. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. And same and same thing. Maybe you have an emergency situation where like something strikes it or pivots, so maybe you put like a force that's on the top of the top of this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 So the L yeah, I'm trying to like think of the general sense of this thing. In the bracket, like so for the bracket, that is like a Exactly. Oh, uh, so as a TV bracket? Exactly. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking so, of that or exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm not thinking like a ball bracket as a sound. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think. Because when I was sitting down yesterday and I was trying to think of like, the bracket sounds like a good idea, but I can't think of any like real world like application. Uh -huh. Like, I'm like, TV mount. Like that's probably that's probably the most common one. Yeah, this, this is a pretty long TV. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it's sort of like you know, looking at the quote in and out. Exactly. Like, yeah. So yeah. Any exactly. Like, exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, these. So I mean, all of these are are kind of sports and but the simplified versions of kind of what it would actually yeah, be. Yeah. 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 And so that's what I usually tell people. This is this is kind of like a TV. There's no TV that actually looks like this, mm -hmm. but it's uh, but it's it's the same yeah, idea. You can't plan, yeah, plan yeah. Idea. Exactly. Oh, so okay. you can apply kind of the mode in the same way as if it were like this. Oh, okay, cool. That's how I was like. So I have to press on the on the engine. Do we have a phone? Yeah. Yeah, because I want to apply that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do the port. Um, we, I mean, we haven't done an example of that class, but you could apply it in the same way. So, yeah, okay. And so I think most of what I've kind of been to is just like this. I will apply it for that. Of course, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Really yeah. Like, it looks like, it looks like it's like more like just for a boat, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, I think specifically, I think that one's a Lego. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you're talking about, yeah, yeah, but but yeah, that the shape of that is more like a more like a like a boat. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, we were like, oh, let's do a plane. And yeah. then, uh, I was like, don't take my idea. I mean, you could, I mean, you could make the argument for both. So, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, but it's just the original. Yeah. 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 I was saying an RC. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I was like, but I just, I won't throw it really long. Yeah. It doesn't look like that. So, but like, can you do that for like, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, this is the forces you explain it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, these, I mean, these geometries are, are more simplified versions, but you can definitely apply that to the okay. Yes. Because we didn't know how to set, like specific mode in Yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, it, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. You know. Yeah. I mean, you're you're not going to find these geometries on on a Lego kit. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, these are all simplified versions of kind of what they do. So I don't I don't need a very detailed one, but you know, in fact, you know, if you use your imagination. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Let's bring up on the road, by the way. Oh yeah. Oh, you got you got it to work. Yeah, right. Awesome. Great.